got any questions? So, when we are near arc, if we are standing in the ground, we see a freely falling body move. Yes. So, that is because we are not moving around a geodesic, but that body is. So, we are also moving around a geodesic. Yeah. Well, yeah, when you are standing on the earth, you are not moving around the geodesic because there is an extra force. Extra force, yeah. Normal, yes. yeah, that's right. The, that body is moving around, it's a negative layer friction. Yeah. That body is moving around, yeah. that's why we see its motion. Yeah. Now, of course, relative motion okay. is there even if you are uh, no. on a geodesic because. Means uh, accelerating. Yeah. So, acceleration, locally, you will not see acceleration. That if both objects are falling yeah. under. Uh, sir, when you are standing on the ground, there is a force, but it's the same geodesic equation with the force part, not the zero on the other side. Yeah, so it's not geodesic anymore. The geodesic, by definition, is the curve without the force. Free, right? free force. Yeah, the geodesic equation is zero on the right hand side. With the very fact that you are standing on the earth, means that you are not on the geodesic. Sir, what is the extra force when you are standing on the earth? Because the electromagnetic force at the Floor is exactly normal. Normal, normal force. Yes, exactly. Okay, that's non gravitational. So, this uh, principle of equivalence is valid for gravitational force. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so yesterday we arrived at an, an expression for the electromagnetic current. So let me write that down again. So this is in a general coordinate system, J mu of x <coughs> was given by Of the square root of determinants of g. Okay, but after all, it's 
made of the matrix. Right? So it should be possible to express this in terms of derivatives of the matrix. So this is something you have to do a little carefully. Right? How to calculate a determinant, the derivative of a determinant of a matrix in terms of the derivative of the matrix elements. Okay? And the way it will appear is that this will be given by square root of minus determinant g times some combination of gamma okay, which you have to determine. And once you have determined this, you can easily calculate d nu j nu because it has a derivative term as well as a gamma term and you have to show that this vanishes. <coughs> Is this clear? Okay, so this will be somewhat of an involved calculation, but it's straightforward as well. Okay, so last time we also did two other things which is to derive the expression for the energy moment of tensor in the local inertia frame, right? We derive the energy moment, expression for the energy moment of tensor in the uh, flat space, right? And then we said that that expression will take over as the correct expression in the local inertia frame. And we have two sets of energy moment of tensors, the matter energy moment of tensor and the electromagnetic energy moment of tensor, right? Both expressions you have found in the uh, flat space. Okay, or equivalently in the local inner cell frame. So given this, of course we can calculate T mu nu matter simply as del mu x <coughs> rho del mu x prime rho del mu x prime sigma Sigma. Okay, or if you want upstairs, maybe I can write this right. So P matter mu nu. This will be del prime rho x nu, del prime sigma x nu. P matter. And the same thing is true for electromagnetic. You mean know, electromagnetic? You know, as the prime rho x nu, del prime sigma x nu, So these you had already found. Okay. And using this, you have to <coughs> calculate these. Because these are the expressions, so you have to basically write down these expressions and then manipulate things a little. Okay, so exactly in the way that we manipulated the expression for J. Right? This also we got from starting with J prime nu and multiplying by a factor like this. So again, this is a straightforward exercise to check the following expressions. So T mu nu. Is given by one
So here the indices are raised and lowered by key value. You have defined energy momentum tensor in a general frame as the one that you get by taking the transform of the energy momentum tensor from a prime frame. Right? So this you can take as a derivative, uh, as a definition. Right? Use the expression for this in terms of f prime. And there you know what f, f mu you have already defined earlier right? in terms of f prime. So using that relation, you can re express t mu electromagnetic in terms of f. Right? So that's the logic that you independently define t mu em in this way. Sort of, we are showing that this holds in general frame. Exactly, that's right. Yeah, we are showing that it holds in general frame. So we start with t prime mu nu expression in terms of f prime. Right? We have already defined earlier what f mu nu is in terms of f prime mu nu, and we have already defined earlier what <coughs> mu nu is in terms of t prime mu nu. Right? So now there is no further freedom. Right? We just use the expression calculate t mu nu, and we can show that this is given by this. Right? We can re-express in terms of this. And you see that the square of 1 over square of minus determinant g appears here also. And that again, the origin of this is exactly the same as what happened for the current, right? Because it's basically because of this. Right? There is a delta 4 of x prime minus x n prime, which you have to convert to delta 4 of x, and that gave rise to this. Is this okay? And then finally, this basically comes from the uh, fact that this uh, J mu nu is not a covariant tensor unless and only there is a weight of these delta functions as we have written this chain of coordinate delta function. Well, it depends on what you mean by comes from this. I mean, it's there that we have defined J prime nu in the prime frame, right? And then J nu by definition is what you get by transforming yes. in the uh, mm. from prime frame to unprime frame. Uh, <coughs> right? And this is what you get. Yes. After you have gotten this, then you can show that this transforms as a tensor. Right? Yes. Without this, it would not transform as a tensor. Yeah, right? that's because the delta function have a weight will have so. extra determinant factor. Mm. Basically, this term cancels this weight factor. Exactly. When you change the transform, so this definition, so this factor comes when you are making transformation for prime frame. Okay. But after it has come, you can show that this is necessary in order that this transforms as a tensor. So without this factor, it will not transform as a tensor. Okay. Because if you now go from x to x double prime frame, okay. this will again pick up some determinant factor, right? In going from x, x to x double prime. That determinant factor has to cancel against something, right? And that happens from this one. Is this okay? So the final exercise is to show that T mu of T mu nu plus T mu nu electromagnetic is equal. But here <laughs> To prove that this is zero, you have to use both the equation of motion for a charged particle in the presence of electromagnetic field and the field equations for the electromagnetic field itself. <coughs> okay, because after all, it's not surprising because even d prime mu, d prime mu nu plus d prime mu nu electromagnetic, right? When you try to show this, you need those two equations. So first mu nu is matter t mu. Pardon? First mu nu is matter t mu. This is matter, yes. Now, you could say that, okay, given that this was zero in the prime frame, in the local inertial frame, okay, isn't it automatic that this will be zero? Okay. The reason that it's not fully automatic is because it could be that this, when you calculate, involves some transcendental and tensor on the right hand side. 
Yes, it is tensor equilibrium, but that could be terms in one of the departments. Yes, and in that case, it will not be zero. Right? It will be zero in the prime frame. You are not in the prime frame. It will be zero in the in the absence of metric, in the absence of gravity. But you could have gotten some term in one of the departments. Well, that could come from the computer itself. Okay, in fact, there are examples where just replacing the the covariant rising okay, doesn't help because the you may guarantee you, you may make sure that in the prime frame the equations coincide, right? But by the time you have gone to the general frame, right, there is a derivative acting on gamma factor, right, which may produce extra factors for the okay. which will come. Okay, in this case it doesn't happen, this indeed does not. Okay, but well, there is something you have to check that, that because essentially the point is that there are already some gamma factors sitting inside the definition of T. Okay. Because if, for example, well, in this case, so the reason, yeah, in fact, maybe I can explain it that. So the reason that we don't have that problem here is because even though if to begin with it had a dmu a nu minus dmu, okay. So, if there are gamma factors inside it, when you take derivative, right, this derivative could act on those gamma factors. And then those are no longer guaranteed to vanish in the local inertia. Frame. Okay, so this would might not have reduced to the usual equation of the local inertia. Frame. However, as we have seen that in the definition of F, the gamma which appears in the definition of F in the in, in d mu a nu actually cancels against the gamma that comes in d mu a nu. This doesn't have a gamma because this is the same as del mu a nu minus del mu a nu. And because of this, because of this reason, that this term doesn't actually contain a derivative of gamma. And that is the reason why in the local inertial frame, okay, this reduces to the usual equations. Okay, all the derivatives of gamma scans. So, so in this case, uh, if it is uh, below in the local inertial frame, then the full tensor should be in. Yes. So if, from that you can argue, okay, but you have to use this additional input that in the definition of FMU, there are no gamma, right? That when you, that this expression here okay, does not contain an explicit derivative of gamma. Right? In general, if you had a set of equations which has two derivatives acting on some then those two derivatives would involve de derivatives of gamma, right? Because first derivative produces a gamma, first covariant derivative, second covariant derivative produces a derivative of gamma. Okay? Then it's no longer guaranteed that even by going to local inertial frame, it should reduce to the equation that you have gotten in the local inertial frame. Then you start it because there are additional derivatives of gamma which have come. Once you guarantee that that doesn't happen, right? then it's clear that this equation in the local inertial frame it will reduce to the standard equation which you have no is true. So yeah. I was saying that, that um, this is independent of whether the, the principle of equivalence is a secret. No. Yes, that's right. This is independent of whether the principle of equivalence is a secret mm -hmm. principle because sometimes you may not be able to implement it. Not at least in a straightforward way. Right? Because the suppose you want to say that in the local inertial frame. So, if you have a second order differential equation, it has two derivatives, right, which you want to be covariant. Now, take this second order equation and then evaluate it in the local inertia. From the second order equation, you have term, some terms which could involve derivatives of gamma. Right? So, even when you look at evaluate the local inertia, those terms don't go on. Right? Double derivatives of gamma. No, single derivative of gamma cannot be set to zero. Single derivative of the matrix can be set to zero. Oh, single no, derivative no, of gamma no. is like double, 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 double yes, derivative sir, of the matrix, right? Sir, sir. Yeah. So double derivative of the matrix, so those you cannot set to zero. Right? So what I'm saying, even if you write a fully, so sometimes you may be able to write, start with a fully covariant equation, which looks like that if you replace d mu by ordinary derivative, it becomes the flat space equations. Nevertheless, it is not guaranteed that in a local inertial frame, so those equations will actually be flat space. Yeah, because of the fact that there will be extra derivative acting on gamma. So that is something that you have to be careful about.
Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, so this is as much as I will say about construction of the energy momentum tensor. So next I'll start discussing how to find solutions to Einstein's equations. Treat this uh, background, uh, this metric as a background uh, of our system uh, of the space time, and we try to construct fields uh, where we can get this T uh, to be the interacting part, uh, to be the interacting part of the theory, and the G minus is totally the background. Not necessarily. I mean, Einstein's equation gives the equation for G right? Yeah, absolutely. So G is not necessarily the background. Yes, but it, it, it's it's kind of you can think of it as a changing background. Kind of a thing that is changing over space and time. No, it's on the same footing as electromagnetic field. So, right. you can write down the electromagnetic field equations. Right? Mm. You did that those field equations tell us how you get electromagnetic equation evolves in this fun function of time or as a function of space. Right? Mm -hmm. Same is true for Gimini. Mm -hmm. The Einstein's equations right, play exactly the same role as the electromagnetic equations will play for the gauge fields. Yes, absolutely. So, in principle, we can write down field equations and try to have a field theory of this uh, background metric, right? Yes, just like you can have a field theory of the electromagnetism. Yes. So, the total Lagrangian, as we have, def uh, we can define this T mu nu as uh, del, del, uh, del L del G mu nu, delta G mu nu, as the definition of this T mu nu. Okay, we can define it that way. So far, of course, we have not introduced any Lagrangian. Okay. Yes. These are the results just we have to, so what, what we have done so far is we have written things at the level of equations of motion. Yes. Right. Now, if I believe that this equation of motion can be translated to a Lagrangian, yes. then in principle we can write down a equation of motion, uh, uh, action for the gravity also. Yes, exactly. And in that case, in principle someone can calculate not the geometry but the actual energy momentum tensor of the gravity. Well, it depends on exactly what you mean by energy momentum. If you just define this as delta j, delta is delta g mu nu. Mm, that will give me the Einstein right. equation. Yeah, so that, for that thing is the energy momentum tensor. Right? Yes, right. in that sense. So r mu nu minus half or g mu nu minus t mu nu or plus the other. You take everything on the one side. Hmm. That will that be the energy momentum. Energy momentum. That is identically zero. Yes. Right. Yes. If you define the energy momentum tensor that way. But if I want to like level energy energy scales with this uh, gravity and try to define. Uh, uh, like a general field theory, try to define energy states. Uh, how to do that in that case? Like uh, in electromagnetic theory, I can introduce particles which carries energy of the field. But uh, yes, yeah, so you have to define here. You have to do first define energy. Just like in electromagnetic case, field, uh, case you define charge in terms of surface integrals, right? Hmm. So here also you have to first define energy in terms of surface integrals, yes. and then you can talk about how that energy is changing as a function of time. Yeah, what kind of behavior the energy has. Right? But so far we are just looking at the field equations for uh, 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 coupling system, right? Mm. Which involves the uh, the G mu is a dynamical field, A mu is a dynamical field, and the matter uh, particles which are moving around mm. are also dynamical variables. Mm. Right? And what we have done so far is to really write down a set of coupling equations mm. for gravity, electromagnetism, and a set of matter particles. Mm. Okay? We have not claimed that they come from the Lagrangian, although you can in principle write down. Hmm. A Lagrangian from which you can derive this as all well the hmm. Okay. So let me turn to solution to Einstein's equation.
But before we go into solution to Einstein's equation, let's recall some aspects of the equations that we get in Newtonian gravity. So the simplest problem that we solve in Newtonian gravity is the gravitational field of a point mass. Okay? So suppose you have a point mass m sitting at the origin. Then the field equation is del square phi is 4 pi g m delta x. Okay, phi is the gravitational potential. Okay, so this is Newton's theory. But by actually solving this equation, okay, it's much easier to use the symmetries and forget about the source at least at the beginning. So you, one can use the fact that this gives a spherical symmetric solution. Right? If the point mass is sitting at the origin, it should give a spherical symmetric solution. Okay. And then, so use spherical symmetry. And then we say that del square phi is 0 away from the origin. And just solve for phi, satisfying these two conditions. And these two conditions basically determine phi, determines phi as c over r plus b. That's here and here constants. Then we also often said b equal to 0. Okay, because you can take the, you know, it can be a constant shift that doesn't affect anything. So you take the gravitational potential to be 0 at infinity. And then finally we have to determine c. And the way we determine c, is by integrating this equation. Okay, so now we go back to the fact that there is a point source. So integral over r less than or equal to r del square phi d cube r must be given by 4 pi gm some radius, some radius some large radius. It doesn't matter large or small in this case. And let's take some large radius. In this case, we can take R2 into Yeah, so the delta function we are integrating. Mm -hmm. Delta Q, yes, actually. Okay, so three dimensional So you just integrate over a spherical volume of radius r. So that of course encloses the origin. So you can <coughs> pi gm on the right hand side. Now the left hand side we can manipulate by using Stokes theorem as integral drag phi dot ds. Over the surface r equal to r. Now drag phi from here is minus c over r square times unit vector along the r direction. So when you integrate this at small r equal to capital R, you get minus c over r square times 4 pi r square. Okay, that's the surface area of the sphere of radius r. So this gives you minus 4 pi c. Now we compare these two. Compare to get c equal to minus gm. And that tells us that phi is minus gm over r. Okay, 
and this is the way we solve Newton's equation for the gravitational potential of a point mass. So what we are going to do is to do a similar thing in Einstein's theory. Okay, now we want to set up the same problem. We have a point mass which is producing gravitational field. We want to find this gravitational potential. And the intuitions that we are going to use is exactly the same as in the Newton's theory. Namely that if you have a point mass okay, at the origin, we expect a spherical symmetry. Okay, so it doesn't matter which direction you look. Okay, so there should be a spherical symmetry. The other aspect which again is visible from here is time transition symmetry. It should be time independent because the point mass is just sitting at the origin. Okay, so spherical symmetry, time independence. And finally, the fact that the point mass is sitting at the origin means that away from the origin, you can set the source terms to zero. That T mu nu should be zero okay, on the right hand side. So you have to basically solve Einstein's equation in the absence of any point source. So let me list those ingredients. So you put time independence, time independence. Yeah. Time independence. Yeah. because if you think of a point mass sitting at the origin, don't move it. So matrix should be time independent, spherical symmetry, matrix should be spherical symmetry. We are assuming that no, no electromagnetic field, okay, just Einstein's equation coupled to matter, that is the point, uncharged point particle sitting at the origin, okay, which is producing gravitational field and you have to calculate the field of that particle. So is this clear? So you have to understand what it one means by that, right? Physically, you expect this, these properties, but then how to translate this into uh, mathematical language, you have to see. So physically, also, we uh, imagine the spherical symmetry in embedded space. No, no, no embedding space. In general, you, you don't have, you ever go to embedding space right, to solve answers. You have to define spherical symmetry in the space time that you are, you are living in. So first, this condition is easy to implement. Okay. This condition tells us that we are basically solving the equation R mu nu. So 3 implies that R mu nu minus half R g mu nu equal to 0. And this is the equation we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Now, if we multiply this by g mu nu okay, and contract, the first contraction gives you R. Right? That is the definition of R. R is R mu nu g mu nu. Mm -hmm. Second one gives you minus half R times G mu nu G mu nu, right? That is the inverse, right? It is like a multiplying an inverse matrix with itself but taking a trace. So that gives you 4. Okay, this 4 comes from G mu nu G mu nu. So this is R minus 2R basically. So this is 2R. So net upshot is that R is 0. And when you substitute it here, 
we get Einstein's equation and R mu is equal to 6. So in the absence of source, Einstein's equation in four dimension is equivalent to R mu is equal to 0. Okay, so this is the equation you have to solve. But now you have to understand what you mean by time independence and spherical symmetry. Now later we will discuss that there is a coordinate independent way of specifying what this means. But for now, let's interpret it in the following way. That it is clear that if we have a metric which is time independent, which doesn't depend on time, then you can make a change of coordinates in which it looks time dependent. Time dependent. Okay. Because after all, suppose g mu is independent of t. Okay. Now you make a change of coordinate where t goes to some function of t. Okay. Then that g mu will certainly depend on t. Okay. Or x goes to some function of x and t. Okay. That will start depending on t. Okay. So time independence, as it stands, it looks like it's a coordinate dependent concept. Now, in actual practice, it is not. There is a way to define time independence, also spherical symmetry, which is coordinate independent. But for now, we will interpret time independence in the following way. We will interpret it in the way that there exists a coordinate system in which the metric is manifestly independent of time. Okay, that it is possible to describe, find a coordinate system t x1, x2, x3, in which the metric is independent of time or x1. Okay. This is not a coordinate independent statement, this is, a, the, this is a statement that there exists a particular coordinate system in which this happens. A general metric will not have this problem. Okay. For a general metric, you may not be able to find any coordinate system in which it becomes independent of one of the coordinates. Similarly, spherical symmetry will implement by saying that there exists a coordinate system in which the metric is invariant under x1, x2, x3 going to some rotation matrix as x1, x2, x3. Clear? So, 1 and 2 implies that there exists, this is our definition of what we mean by 1 and 2. There exists a coordinate system. ds square goes to ds square, ds square is the metric expression under first of all p goes to p plus c, where c is any constant and xi goes to sum over j equals 1 to 3 r i j x j i also runs from 1 to R is a rotational matrix. R R transpose is identity. Okay, R is time in, well, uh, space time independent, just fixed metric, the fixed uh, orthogonal matrix. So this is what we will take as a definition of spherical symmetry. Now given such a coordinate system, you can certainly choose another coordinate system in which this is not possible. So it is in this sense that this definition looks like it is a coordinate independent definition. Okay, as I said, there is a way to make it give a coordinate independent definition, but that is more complicated. So for now at least we will take this as a definition of what you mean by spherical symmetric metric and what you mean by time dependent independent metric. Sir, ds square is always same under coordinate of No, ds square is same under coordinate of so no, the metric will not change, right? That if you keep the metric fixed, I will explain what, what exactly this condition implies. Right? Of course, yes, if you make a transformation of coordinates, mm -hmm. right, then it will change, right? But what I am saying is that you take the expression for dx, dx square, mm -hmm. okay? in that expression you make this term, transformation and it will remain unchanged. This is not a coordinate transformation. 
Well, it's a coordinate transformation, but you are not changing, you are allowing the components to change, the components of the metric to change. Okay? So, the DS square, the form of DS square will remain the same. Okay? Let me implement it, then it will probably become clear. Okay? So, for example, this will mean that a function of t times dt square is not an allowed term in the metric. Why not? Because if you change t to t plus c, okay, it becomes the function of t plus c times dt square. Yeah, that is a different form. Okay. So that will not be allowed in the metric. Okay. So of course on a coordinate transformation, right, if you think of it as changing the metric also, mm. okay, then by definition ds square is invariant. Okay. Right. But here you don't want to change the form of the metric. Right. You simply take the expression for ds square and substitute for t as t plus c okay. and see if the metric changes its form or not. Is this clear? That's what happens for the Minkowski metric, right? That's what I mean by saying that it's Lorentz invariant. Because if you start with dx0 square minus dx vector square okay, and make a Lorentz transformation, x mu going to lambda mu nu times x this, it remains as dx0 square minus uh, dx vector square, right? Metric doesn't change. Metric doesn't change. Yeah, so that's what I mean by saying that it's invariant. Analysis, right? The metric will not change. <coughs> but I think it will become clear when you try to implement it. So what we will do is to write down all possible terms in the metric consistent with this requirement. So if the t mu of that point mass will be right away. Yes. In the frame in which you have that point mass at rest. Yes. So that t mu will be a singular type of equation. It may be singular, so we will not we will never talk about that t mu at all, right? Because just like here we didn't really have to talk about the source, right? We got finally the constant c by looking at asymptotic integral. Okay. So here also we will fix all the constants by looking at asymptotic integral without ever worrying about what the t mu nu is at all. I am thinking because it will include a term like dx mu by d tau, something like that. Right? And those terms will be 0. So it will be really helpful. No, d t d tau will not be 0. Right? Because that is fixed at a um, fixed at the origin, right? So dt data will not be zero. Right? So only the t zero zero will get non-zero contribution. Okay? Some kind of delta function contribution. Okay? Dxi data will be zero. Okay. So, but we are not, as I said, we will not look at that uh, explicit source term. Yeah, but we will get everything from as Okay, the idea is that we try to go, keep away from a singular term uh, place as much as possible. Okay, so now let's define one quantity r as square root of x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square. Okay. And it's clear that r goes to r under those transforms. The source term was present. So, for example, t matter was not zero. Yes. In some situation. So then, uh, do, we have, uh, do we have to include the t mu nu em also? Because then only. Well, if the matter is charged, yes. If the matter is not charged, then you don't have to. It could be that the matter is not charged, right? In that case, t mu nu matter is conserved by itself. Okay. Uh, if the matter is charged, then you have to include the t mu nu em also. Otherwise, it's not consistent to solve this equation. Okay, so this quantity is clearly invariant under this transformation. So that if you replace x by this, r remains the same. Okay, r is the usual radial distance in Cartesian coordinates, right? Because this is just these are like Cartesian coordinates. The metric, of course, is not the same, not Cartesian metric, right? Otherwise, they will flat space, right? That clarity doesn't describe. A, uh, okay, so let's start by writing down the first term. Okay. So dt square, okay. minus dt square. So what can the coefficient depend on? Yes. It can depend on r. 
which are multiplied by some function of r. Can it depend on something else? It cannot depend on something else because it cannot depend on t because that will make this not invariant under this transformation. Right? And it cannot depend on x1, x2, x3 in any other way because that will not be invariant under this transformation. So it can depend on r and you close this. This is the one term in the back. Next, let us look at the term which has one factor of dt and dxi. The structure of the terms is that we have a dt sigma, we have dt dxi terms and dxi dxi terms, right? We have the three kinds of terms, right? The, in a four dimensional space. So, dt dxi. So, let us look at dt dxi. What can it depend on? Is this so? What can the coefficient be? It will mix x and t, that is okay. Um, as long as it is spherical symmetric, we have to make sure that when we make this replacement that is given there, this metric is unchanged. So, t goes to t plus t is okay. Right? As long as what about we multiply, it does not depend on t. Pardon? No, no, so you have to make it rotational invariant. Dt dxi is not rotational invariant, right? Because it is transforming as a vector. Yes? Something of R inverse. No, no, R is a transformation part, right? So it has to hold for any R. So R is not going to enter this. I mean, you write this first and then make sure that under that transformation this does not change. Okay, so what can you do? Some covariance. Yes? Multiply by xi. Multiply by xi. Okay, so this combination dxi times xi does not change under this. This is a product, right? Between two vectors. See, if xi changes like this, then dxi, so under this dt goes to dt, right? And dxi goes to rij dxt. Right? So, dxi also gets rotated. So, dxi times xi, this is invariant under that transformation. Won't it be lower index? Well, for i index, right, we are just using all upper index because this is just normal flash space rotation matrix, right? Okay, so, we will be always using coordinate system in with upper i, right? Is this clear? Okay, if it is not clear, this, what does this become? This becomes R i j d x j times R i k d x d x l R i yes, R i k x k sum over i j k all running from 1 to 3. Yes. Sum over i also. Sum over i. Yes. I should write this. Sum over i. So R i j, R i k is delta j k. R r transpose, right? Mm -hmm. This gives you delta j k. So delta j k gives you dx i times dx j times x j, which is the same as what you started with. Okay. So this combination is invariant under rotation. Can it be multiplied by something? Some other function of R, F2 of R. Suppose f1 is x1 and f2, uh, uh, suppose f1, f2 1 is x1 and f2 uh, 2 is x2 square. That is not going to be rotation in the right? I need the sum over xi square. 
that is rotationally invariant. We can no, write not, it. Not necessarily sum over x as well. This is sum over dx i times x i. Yeah, I can write also. You write the f2i, right? See, this is, we are looking for specific functions, right? What kind of f2i will do the job? Uh, f2i has to be proportional to xi. Yes. Different equal to no, what I am trying to say that this is dxi xi, I can write it to be d of xi square and take the d out that will be sum over i xi square that is d of r square. Yeah, but that, that comes later, it is not necessary that you have to be able to write it as d of xi square, right? This yeah. by definition is rotational invariant, right? And the point is the fact that this is rotational invariant we are not doubting, right? That nobody is out. So what people are doubting is whether instead of xi you can write something else, fi of x. But if you want to try to write some fi of x, right, you have to say what fi is. And fi is some function of x, right? So what kind of function will make it rotation invariant? Right? The only possibility is fi of x should be proportional to xi. Because xi transforms in a certain way. So fi of x has to be a function which transforms exactly as r ij fg, right? Okay? And the only function that transforms that way is that one is proportional to fg or xj. Okay, and then there can be a function f2 upon multiplying it. Okay, this is completely arbitrary function. Then you have dxi dxj. So what are the possible things you can do here? You need two index object, right? Hmm. Xi, 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 for the, for i and j same, yes. there is no need for this xi and xj because yeah. dx So that's delta ij. Right? Delta ij times f to the power. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. right? And you can say none of these can be made dependent on time. Okay, because if it make if it's dependent on time, then you destroy time classes invariance, right? It's no longer equivalent hundred t goes to two plus. Is there anything else that one can write down? The general structure is here, dt, dt dxi and dxi dxj, right? This is this covers everything, right? So the only question is whether there is any any other kind of thing you can write down here or here or here. This is the full story. The one you have to, at some point you have to make a decision as to whether it's a full story or not. <laughs> you cannot keep thinking forever. So yes, this is the full story. You can convince yourself that there is nothing else that you can write down. Okay. So this is the most general spherically symmetric time dependent metric that you can write down in a specific coordinate system. Sir, but dimensionally are these terms carrying equal dimensions? Well, that, uh, I have not told you what the dimensions of F3 and F4 are. Right? So yes, you are right, every term has to have same dimension, but those can be adjusted by suitably choosing the dimensions of F3, F4, F1, F4. Okay, right now we have not said anything about those. Okay, later on when you actually find explicit expressions for this, then you can again check for the dimension of these things agree or not. Okay, so what we are going to do now 
Okay, so now that we have written down the most general spherical symmetric metric, now we are going to make change of coordinates. Okay. We are not going to change anything that is given here. Okay, but now starting from this, we can go to another coordinate system, right? Hmm. Where maybe the spherical symmetry is not mani completely manifest. Okay, or maybe it's manifest, we will see. So the first change of coordinates that we do is to r theta phi. So instead of using x1, x2, x3, we use r theta phi. And this change is exactly as you will have from Cartesian to polar. So x3 is r cos theta, x1 is r sin theta cos phi, and x2 is r sin theta sin. This r is the same as this one. Right? Because if you use this definition and calculate x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square, you get exactly x1 r square. Okay, so this r is the same as this r. Now, we can check that dxi, dxi, sum over i dxi, dxi, which is one of the terms, right? Square plus r square d theta square plus r square sin square theta d phi square. This, in fact, is an exercise that we have done earlier, okay, in going from Cartesian to polar coordinate system, right? This is, we have the same. So this is one of the things that we have dxi dx. So the other thing you have to calculate is sum over i dxi xi. This is just the square of that. Okay, so sum over i dxi xi is what you have to calculate. Sum over i dxi times xi. This in fact is easier because it's half d sum over i xi xi. But this is nothing but r square. Mm -hmm. So this is r dr. Okay. So using this, we write down the metric. This is minus f1 of r d square plus R times F2 of R, DPDR. Okay, I am using the fact that sum over DXI XI is equal to RDR. I just wrote the R here. Then let's write the F3 first. So F3 of R plus F3 of R. The corresponding coefficient is just DXI DXI, sum over I. So which is here. So d r square plus r square sin square theta d theta square d r square and finally we have 4 of r times r square d r square. So now the idea is that we try to simplify this as much as possible by changing coordinates. Okay. So next thing we are going to do is to try to remove, get rid of this. We will try to get rid of this term by making a change of the time coordinate. Okay. So define so second term. Second term. Yeah, cross term. The DPDR cross term is what you are trying to get rid of. 
define p prime p equal to p prime plus pi r. Okay, some unknown function. Okay. Some function which will determine. So this change, of course, doesn't do anything to this. Okay. This remains exactly as it is. This is just R theta pi. But the first two terms change because they have to be now read in the T prime board So I'll not write the argument just for simplicity minus f1 dt square plus r f2 dr dt this becomes minus f1 dt prime plus dr phi dr squared plus r f2 dr Is this okay? Now you just expand it out and collect terms which are similar. So this is a simple algebra minus f1 dt times square, right? That's the only term that involves dt times square. Mm. Then dt prime dr contains two terms. One is from this cross product over here, so minus 2f1 times dr prime. Mm. The other one is from here, plus rf. And then there is a dr square term which is minus f1 dr phi square plus r f2 And now the idea is that so far we have not said anything about phi. Phi has complete arbit unknown function, arbitrary function, right? Mm -hmm. Now we are going to adjust phi to cancel these two terms. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. So this is general, right? I just said that I made a change of coordinates t going to t prime plus phi of r. Phi is some function that you have not said what it is, right? But now we are going to say what it is. We are going to choose phi in such a way that this is exactly 0. Okay? If this is exactly 0, then the dt prime dr term will go away. Okay? That's what you are going to do. Okay? So this is the way you are going to choose phi. So let me write it. So choose phi such that minus 2f1 r dr phi plus r times f2 of r equal to 0. Which means that del r of phi should be r times f2 of r over 2f1 of r. And you can write down the solution for this phi of r as integral in upper limit du with some arbitrary, this is starting with some arbitrary point r naught, du times u f2 of u of 2 of r. U is the integration value. Oh. Right? This is 
upper limit of the u integral is r. So if you can calculate the del del r of phi, okay, you basically pick up the integral divided around the upper limit. Okay, that gives you r times f2 of r or 2 f1 of r. You are putting this lower limit r because we want to exclude the infinity at c, right? Lower limit of you can put anywhere, that's just a constant shift, right? Changing the lower limit just means phi goes to phi plus a constant. Yes, right? but phi goes to phi plus constant doesn't affect anything, right? This is a time transfer, right? Yes. That's a symmetry anywhere. But this uh, f1, f2 contains the information about the metric at uh, r equal to 0, right? Well, that is true, but the part I'm saying is that changing r naught to some r not prime. Yeah, that will not affect. Means a shift of phi of r. Yeah, that's true. Yes. But what I'm trying to say that I cannot in principle put r not equal to 0. Yeah, you have to put r not somewhere where there is no singularity. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are many r not, right? Many you just put it somewhere in the middle. Anyway. Where well, if one is uh, not 0. Mm -hmm. okay, in particular, near asymptotic region, right, for large r, mm -hmm. we know that f1 should be nearly equal to 1, right? Because the dt square coefficient should be equal to 1, etc. Right? So you can put R0 to some like, large value mm -hmm. and integrate from R0 to R. Right? Where if one doesn't manage. Well, you can, you have to make sure that this integral is convergent. Right? You can say F2 of U as long as it goes up to 0 sufficiently fast. We are not so far determined what F2 of U, how F2 of U behaves. But if it goes up sufficiently fast, you can put R0 to infinity, but otherwise you don't need it. This R0 is completely arbitrary, right? Because changing R0 is just shifting phi, right? which has no effect at all, right? That can be absorbed into a time trans transition of T, right? Which is a symmetry of the metric anyway. So the final result that you are going to get is completely independent of what R0 you choose. So anyone you need a just a derivative of phi? Phi, exactly, right? So the, since you are only in interested in derivative of phi, you can see from here. Yeah, everything depends on the derivative of phi. So there is no place where R not enters in the phi in the form of the Is this okay? okay? So this gets rid of this term. Hmm. So I can cross out the first two lines and replace it by these terms. Okay, because the first two lines is what I evaluated here. Mm. No, the second. This yes. first, first line, yeah. The two terms in the first line is what we evaluated. Mm -hmm. I write g square as minus the point dt times square. Just this term has gone away. We can just put t because it's arbitrary. Yeah, I got put it yeah. plus dr square. So let's collect all the coefficients of dr square. Okay? So minus f1 del r phi square. Now you could have replaced del r phi from here, okay, but let's not do this. I mean, phi is determined anywhere. So I could have written it, but let me just write it okay. Minus f1 del r phi square plus r f del r phi. Phi. And then here you have an f3 plus f3 plus r square. Plus F3 of R times R square times R times R del r phi is square, del r phi, yes. Anything else? No, I am saying that the variable phi and the function oh. phi are. Oh, oh. Uh, let me call this. You can use. Yeah. 
because all these are change these two. Is this okay? Okay, so these these are all functions of R. So this makes this term simple. This becomes rho square. This dr we are going to now write in terms of d rho. Okay, d rho over this complicated thing. But now we just change the names of the functions. We can call f1 of r rho is some function of r. So f1 or r of r is some function of rho. Let's call it psi of rho. Similarly, this whole thing, let's say minus minus f1 dr phi t minus square plus r of 2 phi t minus plus r square f4. Okay, this is the term you get and but dr square when you express you get <coughs> divided by f3 times 1 plus r dr f3 over 2f3 square. This we declare as some function chi of Is this clear what we are doing? Basically, this f4 you have declared as psi and this dr I express in terms of d rho and whatever is the coefficient, right, this is some complicated function of r, we just call that chi of rho. Because this is some function of r. 
Now through this, we get R as some function of low. Right? So you just substitute for R, whatever it is, you'll get a function of low. Right? That function of low is what you are calling psi of low. Right? So this equation defines what psi of low is. Similarly, this equation defines what chi of low is. Okay? It's some complicated function of R which are at a sky of flow. What is important is that this is only a function of R and nothing else. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why it can be written only as a function of flow. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a theta phi of t dependence in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question is at this stage, we may ask whether it's single valued or not. Okay, whether these equations are invertible. Okay. The way to I may mean, analyze this question is that you first go far away, okay. near r equal to infinity. So near r equal to infinity, which is that f3 should be equal to almost 1. Right? So near r equal to infinity, we get rho equal to r times something of order 1. Right? So there it is certainly invertible, r is equal to rho. Now it may happen that somewhere in the interior, okay, there may be branch cuts. We do not know what these functions are to begin with. Okay? So let us allow for branch cuts. Right? If there are branch cuts, we will discover it. In Finding the solution. Okay. But at least near infinity, the, the, you know, going from R to rho is possible, right? It's important. Okay. So we analyze the solution, we analyze all these coordinate transforms near infinity, argue that that's single valued, and then use that to rewrite it in terms of rho. Okay. And then later on we will see if the solution as a function of rho develops some kind of branch lines. Is this okay? Second. Yes, yeah, so what we are asking is that whether I have said that this you eliminate R in terms of law. Right? Now we don't know what this function F3 is. Right? So it could be that this transformation is not single value, right? Maybe R cannot be solved in terms of law. But you know for sure that near infinity, right? It can be solved because F3 is nearly equal to 1. Right? Because the matrix has to be almost equal to the flat matrix. So at least there you know that R is equal to rho plus corrections. So that is a unique solution, right? So we accept that as the solution, that branch. And then if there are additional branch points, we will find it later, right? We now express everything in terms of rho. And then we will see, for example, if there is a problem, they will show up as some kind of branch cards in psi and phi, okay? which will tell us that the psi, rho is not a correct coordinate system to use. Okay? But whether rho will be a correct coordinate system or not will be contained in the form of the metric express in terms of law. We can work in one branch. Hmm. Well, if, if the final metric has branch points, right, then we have to interpret that. Right? And that basically says that probably rho is not the correct ra radial coordinate to choose. But for now, we simply assume that we can invert this and go ahead. Right. Write everything in terms of row and see what we get. So this more or less brings the matrix to a much more manageable form. So it's minus psi of rho. And so I should also say I just rename E prime as P. E prime as P. Okay. Because T has gone anywhere, so I don't write pi prime every time. So minus psi of rho dt square plus pi of rho zero square plus rho square times v theta square plus sin square theta d square. So oh, f4 has also gone uh, here. This whole thing is high. Because this is also part of the thing. See here, f4 is also inside this bracket, right? Multiplying oh, the Yeah, this is f3, f3 times r square has become rho square. Right? And this whole thing, after this additional factor going from r to dr to dr, has become r time. Sign of dt prime square? Yeah, so I have, I have this renamed P prime as T, right? Because after all, this is just a coordinate, right? So it, it was P prime because originally I said I start with T coordinate, 
Yeah, I could have some the original code and some key and all this thing. That's why just I mean, there's no reason to have the uh, prime hanging around. Okay, so I just remove it. Are there any other questions? So now the idea is that we have to substitute this into Einstein's equation and solve. Okay, this is that means we have to we basically have two unknown functions, psi and phi, which is an improvement compared to the number of unknown functions that we had to begin with. The metric is diagonal, which is also useful because to begin with, this was not diagonal. So with these two functions, we'll now work and see what, what we can get. No, rotational symmetry is what I described initially. That the metric, right. you write down the metric in terms of x1, x2, x3, and t, okay. and it should have a symmetry under which x1, x2, x3 goes to some fixed uh, uh, so orthogonal matrix. Pardon? The interval should be invariant under a rotation. In that full function ds square. ds square, yes. Yeah, so ds square should go to ds square under the change of transformation x1, x2, x3 going to rij times this, right? So that's the starting point. We use the starting point to write down the form of the metric, right? In the x coordinate, x and t coordinate system. After that, all you have done is to manipulate things, right? In this form, we can, I mean, you can ask what, how the rotation acts on this system. It's very hard, right? Because in theta phi coordinate system, it's very hard to describe what rotation matrix acts on. So, if you wanted to see rotational invariance visible, I mean, <coughs> visible symmetry, you have to use the x1, x2, x3 coordinate system, right? Where we started, right? But now we have made coordinate transformations, right? Now, you cannot ask how the rotational transformation acts on this. It will be complicated. Because now rotation transformation by itself is also should be changed. Yeah, it will have some action on theta and phi, right? But it's not a simple action. Okay, so, after the first frame, so, so in the subsequent ones, we cannot ask this question whether this is a rotation invariant. Well, you can ask. As I said, there is a way to invariant way of asking, right? But there is no direct way to check for rotational symmetry, right? Because we used the rotational symmetry in the first frame, right? After that, we have made a lot of coordinate transformations. Right? It's like if you go from Cartesian coordinate to spherical polar coordinate, right? The action of rotation on theta phi is very complicated. Rotation about z axis is simple, mm -hmm. but if you ask rotation about an arbitrary axis, it's not hard. It's hard to describe what action it has on theta and phi. No, but what should we conclude? Like if we have established a rotationally invariant metric in one coordinate system, it is by definition that, that was the definition, right? That there exists some coordinate system in which the metric is has that that symmetry, right? After that, we are just changing coordinates. We have not changed the metric, right? It's physically exactly the same thing, right? So after that, if you change metric, change coordinates. It doesn't destroy the physical property of the metric, right? So it still call this metric rotational invariant because you start it from a rotational invariant, metric and then after that you have only changed coordinates. Okay? So what is guaranteed is that for any psi and phi, okay, the metric is rotational invariant, right? Because to begin with, there is no constraint on f1, f2, f3, f4. The rotational invariants infer that under some class of coordinate changes, the metric remains unchanged. Exactly. Right? And that class of coordinates changes is easiest to describe in the x1, x2, x3, t coordinate system. Mm -hmm. right? In the theta phi t coordinate system, if you want to know what rotational symmetry looks like, it is possible to write it down, but it's not simple. Can we turn out something like this? We turn out something like this. If we, if we use the fact uh, transformation of theta phi, that metric uh, should look like this. Yes, it looks like this. So the point is this metric this. So there is a transformation on theta and phi. Right? which leaves this unchanged, this form. Right? But that transformation Maybe very complicated. is complicated because if you have, you have, I mean, suppose somebody has written down the, the uh, spherical polar coordinate system, mm -hmm. right? And you want to rotate about some arbitrary axis, right? which is neither along z-axis nor along x or y-axis. Okay? If you want to know how theta and phi transforms, it's complicated transformation, mm -hmm. right? There's a simple way to describe how theta and phi transforms. Rotation about the z-axis, of course, is simple. Right? Theta remains the same, phi changes by translation. Right? 
but rotation about any other axis is hard to test in theta 5 coordinate system. So, by the fact that you have control of theta 5 coordinate system means that you cannot easily see what rotation will do to this matrix. Then why, why, are we, why are we saying that in one system, in one coordinate system, I am making my coordinate independent that is a frame dependent? Well, if, what is frame dependent? Right? So, the fact that matrix has something symmetry is not frame dependent. Right? If there is some transformation that leaves, left the matrix unchanged in the original frame, the coordinate system, there will be some other transformation which will leave the matrix unchanged in the new coordinate system. But to find what that transformation is, may not be easy. Right? That is coordinate dependent. That is a coordinate dependent thing. Right? What, what is a, how the rotational transformation acts on the coordinates. Right? That is why to describe a rotation, uh, for, to uh, characterize a rotational invariant metric, it is best to go to the Cartesian coordinate system, Cartesian like coordinate system, where you understand what, how rotation should transform the coordinates. Right? Write the metric in that coordinate system and then change coordinates in any way you like. Okay. That doesn't take away the rotation invariance, but it's just that how the rotation is transformation acts on the new coordinate system will be complicated. Okay. I could mix up T and phi, right? I could make this into a matrix which doesn't look like time independent, which doesn't look like uh, have anything to do with rotational symmetric matrix. Nevertheless, rotation invariance will be there. Right? If, it's a, if you have started from a rotation invariant matrix and made a coordinate change, right? there is certainly some transformation in the new coordinate system which implements the x i equals to r i j x in the original coordinate system. Okay, so maybe I will just write down the expression for the various components of the DC tensor and then stop tomorrow we will solve them. So from this we can, this metric is not very complicated, so we can calculate the distribution symbols and the Riemann tensor and the DC tensor. So what you can show is that the R rho rho is given by psi double prime over 2 psi minus 1 quarter psi prime over psi Prime over five. So prime means del del rho. So all the derivatives are just going to go. R theta theta is minus one plus rho over two pi. R phi phi is just sine square theta times R theta. Now, substitute, you have to now solve 
R T T equal to zero, R zero equal to zero, and R T that's there. R five five will automatically be zero because that's proportional to R T. Now one combination of this equation is easy to solve, so let me do that and then I'll stop. So let's suppose we take psi times r rho plus psi times r t. So when you multiply this by psi, okay, this becomes psi double prime over 2. This is minus psi double prime over 2. So these two terms cancel. This term also you can check cancels. Psi goes away from the denominator, so minus one quarter psi time times this. We have psi goes away, but one quarter psi time times this. So that's also zero. So what we are left with is basically the last terms. So yeah, minus one over rho pi, and then psi pi prime plus pi psi. Prime. Because 1 over rho pi is common. Okay. So this should be 0. Okay. Right? Because after all, r rho and r t t should be 0. The consequence of y is 0. is constant. So this, this is, yeah. So this is the d rho of psi phi. Equal to 0. That says that psi phi is constant. So there is really one independent function. Yes, yeah, so basically the point is we still have two more equations left over, right? Because r theta theta is there. r phi phi is dependent on this. But one linear combination of r rho rho and r t t we still have to solve. Have not solved because you can take the difference. Okay. Yeah, that's an independent equation. But those two should give the same. Got right? Because since you have already determined chi in terms of psi, then it better be that rest of the equations are consistent. Pardon? R theta theta, yes. So the point R theta theta you, you can use to solve for psi, for example, right? Because chi can be eliminated in terms of psi from that equation. So you solve for R, R theta theta equal to 0. After you have used that, then this has to be satisfied automatically. Right? So this is something we can we will try to verify. But there is one last point. Okay, so at this state you have this product equal constant. But now you see that in this metric we still have one more freedom okay, which we can utilize okay, without destroying the structure of the metric, which is that suppose we change coordinates d to lambda. Well lambda is just a constant. Okay, just replace t by lambda. I can always do that, right? You will choose a new coordinate, mm -hmm. which is the t by lambda tau. What is the effect of that? This will be multiplied by lambda square, right? Mm -hmm. So under this, psi will be multiplied by lambda square psi. Everything else will remain the same. Right? Chi doesn't change. Okay, this structure doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So using this freedom, okay. we can set this constant equal to 1. To anything that we like, right? But we will set it equal to 1. Yes. So, provided that constant is greater than 0. Yes, provided that constant is greater than 0. If the constant is negative, then you can set it equal to minus 1. Hmm. Right? If it's 0, then of course it's 0. Right? It, it's easy to see that it's not 0. Right? If it's 0, then psi will be 0 and you will not be able to solve the equation. Hmm. Right? Yes, so assuming that the constant is greater than 1, we can. So, this means that you can set. You can set psi chi equal to plus or minus 1. 1, plus negative to begin with, you can set it equal to minus 1. So, tau equals to lambda times t equals to lambda t. t equal to lambda times tau. Suppose you write t equal to lambda times tau. Okay. Then this becomes minus psi rho lambda square d tau square. Right? So, effectively, this lambda square times psi rho, you can call our new psi rho. 
Okay, tau is a new time coordinate. So using that, basically we can change this constant, right? Because chi you are not changing, you are allowed to multiply psi by some lambda, lambda square. So choose lambda square in such a way that this constant becomes either one or minus one. Is this point clear? Okay. So all you are saying is that take this form of the matrix. Suppose you have gotten some psi and chi. Now, given that, you can just redefine our t by multiplying by lambda. The effect of that is a new psi which will be multiplied by lambda square. Okay, call this psi tilde, okay. which is lambda square times psi. So if psi chi was some constant, psi tilde chi will be that constant scale by lambda square. So change, choose that lambda square to make that constant equal to 1 or minus 1, depending on whether it is one or, uh, positive or negative. Okay. But we can also keep it as constant for now. Okay. At the end, we can set it equal to whatever we like okay, by using that scale in freedom. And now substitute here to solve. In particular, what we will do is we will next solve the r theta theta equation using the fact that chi is constant over psi. Right? So then this will be a purely an equation for psi. Right? Because chi you can substitute as constant over psi. And then we will see what we get. Can it be possible that when something is solved, then you get an inconsistent equation? Like you have put r theta theta equal to 0, r phi phi equal to 0, r theta 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 so not all equations are independent. Right? That's what this is saying. And we already see here that not all equations can be independent. Because you have too few variables. Right? By making coordinate transformation, we got rid of most of the variables. So it's better to do that the equations have some dependence on each other. And that dependence comes because the Einstein's equations are derived from a general coordinate invariant action. Right? The action principle that we use is that guarantees that these equations are consistent. But if you just write down a general set of equations, yeah. four equations, right, then they are inconsistent in general. Right? You will not be able to solve those four equations consistent with the principles of general coordinate. Right? Yes? So, the ending of this constant, that is shy into chi, yes. by knowing the row can to infinity limit, because uh, we know how... Yes, that also you can't do, right? Except that rho can be related to, so you have to uh, make sure that rho actually is the correct radial variable, right? Also, you are in the disk psi, right? Yeah, so if this psi goes to a constant, for example, then that constant you can say should be equal to 1 because coefficient here you have to fix equal to minus 8 square. That's also another possibility. Right? So what you can do is you can keep this constant as it is, right? And we will fix it at the end, right? We will scale t. Forward scaling for Qt is necessary, you can do at the very end. Okay, well, you just keep in mind that there is still a freedom of scaling T. And using that scaling, we can try to bring the solution in, the, in, the, in a more standard form right, that we may like. Okay, any other question? Okay, so we'll continue. Thank you.